The act of being free from bondage, it speaks to a process of liberation from influence, control, or the power of another from slavery. It is freedom from a system or systems of oppression. Emancipation in St. Lucia, the Caribbean, or the West Indies spans continuous, courageous, and critical attempts by the region's inhabitants beginning with the first peoples, the Amerindians, to take back their humanity and reject European slavery and colonization. Enslaved Africans increased and sustained revolutionary activities during the late 18th to 19th century throughout the region's French, Dutch, Spanish, and British colonies. These revolts also influenced unrest among the region's indentured laborers in the British colonies. The Emancipation Celebration is a story of African and indigenous people's triumph over European white supremacy. It is to remind our people of the victorious struggles of their ancestors and to engage their input in building of a new society, a society representing their own ideals, own cultural, social, economic, and political development, which are the prerequisites for a free and independent nation and region. Bienvenue à cette ici pour une discussion à sur l'émancipation et cette cette ici. Non, moi c'est Raïssa Joseph, moi c'est directeur pour Plage Research Folklore à cette ici. Welcome Saint Lucia to a special emancipation discussion on emancipation and land in Saint Lucia. I am Raïssa Joseph and I am the director of the Folk Research Center. Today's discussion is part of the 2022 calendar of events to celebrate emancipation in Saint Lucia. Our discussion focuses on the topic, the dispensation and distribution of land after emancipation. And to assist me to delve into this very critical discussion, we have with us Mr. Calix George Jr., Mrs. Louise Mathre Seri, and Dr. Terencia Kenyatta Joseph. Permit me to tell you a bit about our panelists today 
who will assist us in our discourse. Mr. Calix George Jr. is a St. Lucian son and resident of Grizzly. He is the son of, the Sir, of Sir Calix George and the late deceased Lady Alvina George of Grand Rivier. He was the recipient of the UE Open Scholarship and attended the University of the West Indies Open Campus, St. Augustine Campus, pursuing a degree in electrical and computer engineering. His passions, however, are strongly rooted in the field of history. Upon returning to St. Lucia in 2006, he joined the St. Lucia National Trust, for which he has been a long-standing member of its council. He is also a member of the St. Lucia Archaeological and Historical Society and the Folk Research Center. He served as a research director, editor, and publisher for a monumental historical publication on the history of St. Mary's College, authored by Sir Calix George, which detailed the history of that institution from post-emancipation to the current era. He has served on the Grizzly Constituency Council between 2011 and 2016. Welcome to our program, Mr. George. Thank you. Our next panelist, Mrs. Louise Mafreseri, is a research consultant with over a decade of experience in her field. She previously served as a, an assistant lecturer and tutor in Caribbean history at the UE St. Augustine campus, as well as a research assistant to the university's archaeological center. As a recipient of the Elsa Gavaya Scholarship, she wrote her thesis in history on economic diversification in St. Lucia from 1897 to 1945, in which she uncovered new finding about St. Lucian's agricultural economy during that period. She has served on research committees at the Folk Research Center and the National Reparations Subcommittee. She also holds certificates in research data management, project management, project monitoring and evaluation, and citizen engagement, and has worked in the private and public sectors as a communications and research officer. Welcome very much to our program. It's a pleasure to have you. Last but by no means least, we have Dr. Terencia Kenyatta Joseph, an associate professor in history at the University of the Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago. She is a member of the History and Social Studies Department where she lectures in Indian and Indian diaspora history, Caribbean, women's and gender history, and ethnic minorities. Dr. Joseph is also an adjunct for faculty at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Her research interests include St. Lucia and the Windward Islands with a focus on Indians, children, gender, and the environment. Dr. Joseph is a passionate advocate for community outreach to young people and formal teaching of history at every level of education. I am sure you would agree that this is a more than competent panel in assisting us in delving deeper into this program. At this point, we take a reflection on our current theme for emancipation. My emancipation is my right to articulate my thoughts, my freedom to express those thoughts, my right to be myself, my freedom to be me and embrace my heritage. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Enkilining our consciousness is talking to us as a people in terms of liberating ourselves, moving away from materialistic way of life into a level where we are taking care of our brothers and sisters. Enkindling our consciousness, arousing our awareness. As a people, it's important that we are aware of where we're coming from, who are our ancestors, what are our traditions, what are our cultural identity, as this forms a fundamental basis of who we are, our knowledge of self, and what we can aspire to achieve and achieve. Our past does not dictate our path. Enkindling our consciousness is about igniting an awareness of our past struggles and triumphs to nurture an empowered future. Welcome back to our program as we delve into the topic, the division and dispensation of land after emancipation. Before our break, we spoke about our panelists 
and Apri. So we move to Mr. Calix George Jr., who will share his insights on the topic for today's discussion. Welcome again, Mr. George. Thanks very much, of course, Raisa, and uh, to all the panelists, thanks for being here. And of course, congrats, Raisa, on your Thank recent you appointment, of course, um, as the new director of the Folk Research Center. And I think we're already seeing such great energy being brought to the FRC, uh, a great um, opportunity for rebirth. And of course, this celebration of emancipation, I think, epitomizes that. Uh, it's a really important subject that um, has been selected for this um, discussion this evening. And I, I want to speak to it, uh, although it's a post-emancipation context, but I think sometimes we don't appreciate um, the importance of the struggle of those who went before us and actually impacted the, um, the, the reality of 1848 and 1838, sorry, and where we ended up being at that time. And in particular, um, had it not been the struggle of the indigenous peoples um, right here in Hiwanora, who literally kept at bay uh, the col colonizing forces of Europe, we would have perhaps been in a very different situation uh, in terms of land tenure in St. Lucia. And you can just look at what exists in Martinique, what exists in Barbados nearby. Uh, their stories are very, very different because the extent of resistance that was put forward by the indigenous peoples was not um, as profound. And so St. Lucia had about 100 years lag in terms of its overall development. Um, so whereas you know, Martinique and, and, and uh, Barbados were developed in the 1600s, it was only until the 1740s and even later on where you actually saw the um, establishment of, of colonization, creation of estates and um, people being brought in as a result of the system of slavery, um, which persisted right up until um, 1838. Now, that meant that by 1838, St. Lucia was actually one of the least populated um, of, of the countries in the um, West Indies, in the British West Indies. And again, a lot of that was partly due to the struggle as well of the people who fought for um, wanting their own freedom during the 1790s. So we found ourselves in a very interesting situation um, because in, in the basis of population, which is a major um, factor in terms of land, um, our population was not as large and the land pressures were actually not as large um, as in a number of other countries in the West Indies. And as a result of that, you find that there was a lot of land that was available, um, albeit, however, um, marginal land. And, and then again, when we come to that context, the, the really critical thing to understand um, in this conversation is that the, the, the quality of the land is a major factor there. And we, yes, we have 152,000 acres, 238 square miles. Yes, we, are, you, we say we're larger than, than Barbados, 166 square miles. But Barbados has far more arable land, um, easily cultivated land, than St. Lucia. Somewhere in the region, I think about 33,000 acres versus St. Lucia's mm -hmm. about 6,000, 7,000 acres. So that factor is really important to appreciate. And in the case of St. Lucia, um, the, the best lands were maintained even after um, the, the post-emancipation period, largely by the individuals who held them even before that period. So that's very, very important to, to, um, to note and to understand. Uh, another major issue, of course, was that because of our terrain, our topography, it made development very difficult, including agricultural development. And it, um, there were very many areas that we think of today and we drive through today, um, and we see them as um, cultivated and whatnot, but they actually were not cultivated. And so in that post-emancipation period, you, uh, if you read some of the literature, you will see references to new communities being formed um, shortly after emancipation. <coughs> communities like um, Fosse Jacques, for instance, which didn't exist. Um, you saw persons moving away from the estates and going up into the hinterland, going inland, and trying to create their own, um, eking out their own um, existence. Um, Victoria, um, Chozelle, is another example of, of one of these communities which was formed um, post-emancipation. And so because, again, you had um, 
the changes in the economy as you had um, the rise and, sl and, and fall of, of the primary crop of the day, um, sugar, you found that sometimes, literally, um, agricultural enterprises went bust. And you saw a number of these slumps in the economy. And that also meant that as um, you found them abandoned estates, and these abandoned estates were effectively um, opportunities, really, for people who did not have land. Mm -hmm. And so you did see a lot of that movement towards these abandoned estates or land that was not being cultivated um, as opportunities for individuals. And so within that context, I, I think it's, it's important to see the, the shifts that were going on. And just about 10 years after emancipation by 1848, you actually already had a fairly well-defined um, planter class. Um, sorry, pe peasant class, which is growing individuals who actually were able to, um, either by way of the savings that they had, you had um, individuals who um, had connections of free people from before, that because there were some um, before, and the families supported them to get land. Um, you had people who engaged in sharecropping, uh, and they were utilizing part of the, um, the estates that were still owned by the original landowners, and they were able to actually um, make a living out of that and were able to purchase um, small land holdings. And by 1848, um, one of the major shocks of emancipation on um, free, uh, formerly enslaved individuals was that of taxes. And the colonial government wanted to ensure that whatever was being provided for them, well, they were going to be paying for it. And one of the um, the methods that they used was actually taxation, and they wanted to try to introduce a land tax um, during that period of time, which was not placed on the large estate owners, but was actually only placed on the small land owners. And um, it literally led to a significant eruption um, during that period, um, and it's a very well-known um, tax revolt, which was studied, I think, by Dr. Michael Louis. He did a, a thesis on this matter. And in particular, the areas around Groselay and, uh, and Dauphin, where you had a very large um, peasant class um, developing, they literally came down to, to cash trees. And, and uh, they were trying to make a point. Um, they, they wrote first. They went through that process. Mm -hmm. But the reality was that the colonizing force was not interested in the small man, in the black man. And they effectively were ignored. And it literally got violent. And, and so it's, it's part of that struggle that we need to appreciate um, within that context that there was a lot of oppression by the planter class. They did not have a desire to let go of one of that most critical aspects of economic um, production, which was land. They had already, quote unquote, suffered the loss of the labor because they now had to pay for labor. And they were still, of course, trying to make it difficult in that regard. And so as a result of that, you then saw a new influx of, of people from other islands coming into the country, um, from Barbados, which was overpopulated in particular. Um, but of course, and of course, Kenyatta will speak a lot about that, the Indians yes. who were brought, East Indians who were brought in as well, um, freed, liberated Africans, who effectively added to the pressure, by the way, of the demand for land. You've given us quite a bit in just our initial discourse. And we want to continue on that trend cause, because as you mentioned, Dr. Joseph and also Mrs. Seri will also present to us critical points tied to these very important aspects of our history that our people need to know about as we grapple with our own independent challenges at present. So I want to thank you for these initial comments. And now we'll go to Mrs. Louise Mafra Seri. Thank you very much, Raisa. And good evening to everyone. I want to focus my my talk on the, 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 the title of one of the chapters of my thesis, which was On the Shoulder of the Peasantry. And so I'm going to speak about how a group of persons who were freed from a brutal regime of enslavement on the 1st of August, 1834, and well, received full emancipation in 1838, Became, become landholders who actually carried the economy of St. Lucia on their backs in a short few decades that followed. And so 
I want to start by saying it was certainly not because they were assisted. In fact, it was the complete opposite. They were hindered, as was mentioned by Calix earlier. And so we, we, noted, we noted that in the debates leading up to the passing of the Abolition Act, there were quite a few um, debates in terms of how do you ensure that the enslaved persons remained on the plantation. And the, the, the concern was that they required continuous labor for the plantations. Um, at the time, economic prosperity meant the sugar plantations. They had not paid attention to other options, and the sugar planters held much of the political power and the bargaining power. That's very interesting. Thus, you see mm -hmm. the legislative changes occurring, mm -hmm. and this was, it, was, it did not happen in St. Lucia in a vacuum. That's one of the points I want to make. The, these changes were proposed for all British West Indian territories. So we saw, as Calix mentioned earlier, the, 18, the, the land tax in 18, I think it was 1848. Yes, 1848 land tax, which led to the revolt. There were also taxes on agricultural produce. So it went beyond land tax. There was the 1845 export duties on charcoal, cocoa, and wood, um, whereas these um, duties were not on sugar or sugar products. There was um, the fact that estate machinery was free of duty, but workmen's tools were not. And so just acquiring land in this environment was in itself an act of resistance. But what the peasantry did, and these were the small group of, group of persons who emerged, becoming landholders and actually making productive use of the land to the point that they participated as exporters of crops in St. Lucia. What they did in terms of purchasing land, using it for productive um, subsistence, feeding the nation, that is in itself is an act of resistance extraordinary because they went beyond just owning the land but actually investing in that land and developing it and doing a lot more. So in notes on peasant peasantry development, um, Woodville Marshall would have discussed the fact that the peasantry were, and I quote, a people who practiced thrift and industry, and as a result, they accumulated the purchase of money for land. And this is something um, that you hear being said by um, Governor Brin, who was one of the contemporaries as well. In his research, Dr. Michael Louis, who was mentioned earlier, also um, pointed to the fact that these smallholders, which we call the peasantry, they combine a number of economic activities, such as fishing, crop cultivation, wood cutting, commerce, and other activities in order to in, improve the quality of their lives and accumulate um, funds to purchase land. But that in itself would not be sufficient. So let us look at some of the, the other activities which would have been beneficial or would have contributed to them becoming landholders. So first, I'm going to talk about the métayage in a little bit more detail. Um, this would have been a sharecropping system whereby the former laborers would have provided the, um, the labor on the lands owned by the planters, and they would have provided some of their crops. So it's a, a form of sharecropping, as, as um, would have been explained earlier. And what we found in St. Lucia was quite interesting is that because of the sugar crisis, the former planters saw this sharecropping arrangement as a mean, a, 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 a sort of gap um, during a, a time of low um, sugar prices. And so they could not afford to pay the laborers. They could not afford labor on the plantation. So they resorted to Metea's system. However, the Metea's saw it as a means to an end. They saw it as a way to accumulate funds necessary to purchase land. And so by the 1850s, when some of the planters withdrew, the Metea system, by then, many of the Metea's had already accumulated enough funds to purchase land. And so we see examples such as in 1907, which I found very interesting, this group of Metea's in Denry purchased 607 acres of land. And so that was quite a lot of land. And even in um, earlier than that, you see that um, Devoe, Ellis, and Hamson would have pointed to the 
Metiage being responsible for producing a quarter of sugarcane cultivation in St. Lucia. And then, speaking of a group of Metiage who actually formed in Denry a, a Metiage Association, and they would have actually done that in order to um, cultivate lands as a group and then um, take part in certain community activities such as fun funding schools for children. So it wasn't just about we're getting together, we're meeting as we're owning land, but we're becoming a group of persons who are going to create the vision of freedom that we want for ourselves and for our children. And so that is what land ownership meant to them. So I want to speak a bit about an unused land in St. Lucia and how important it was in terms of the state of things. So I'll give a bit of data. So as Kalik said, we had 152,000 acres comprised in St. Lucia. In 1854, the records show that only 12,182 of that was actually under cultivation. So we could put that in perspective by thinking of Barbados, of of Barbados is 107,000 plus acres. In that period, 100,000 acres were under cultivation. So you could see that huge difference in terms of the amount of land that was available. Mm -hmm. Also in St. Lucia, only 45,000 acres of our land at that time was privately owned. And so we had large amounts of land as crown land, over 1,000, 100,000 acres as crown lands. So when we look at the availability of crown lands as well as un, um, unoccupied private lands due to the sugar, sugar crisis, which had already been mentioned, we could see how the availability of land would have contributed to the rate at which we saw the rise of the peasantry in the region. One of the things we saw uh, in terms of them becoming freeholders, which are land owners, leaseholders, which are persons who basically leased abandoned plantations. Um, let me just say quickly about the leasing of abandoned plantations. This was done by um, former planters who no longer could make profit profitable use of the, um, the soil. So they made the decision that the only way to pull profits out of this, they, they did not have the investments to do anything further with that, so they were there were cases of land being leased to, to former enslaved persons. This was not, of course, very common because, I mean, sugar planters, again, wanted to ensure that these former enslaved remain as a source of labor for the planters. But what we saw among the former enslaved was this overarching theme of cooperation, and this gave them a major advantage. Because as I said earlier, the problem was the aff affording labor for the plantations. What they did was utilize homegrown methods of um, having labor, such as family labor and kudme, which is at the um, informal cooperative system where groups of persons come together to farm each other's land. And also there was um, the establishment of friendly societies whereby by 1897, there were two friendly societies with 131 members. And <coughs> by 1914, there were over 24 friendly societies with over 2,000 members. And these are only the ones that we actually know about. What about those societies that would not have even been, they would have been secret, basically. And so, So um, moving from here, I just want to quickly go into crown the, um, the availability of crown lands. One, one thing that we noted was that as the peasantry made use of these methods and they productively produ um, utilized land, what we found was that they became the main producers in terms of cocoa, limes, um, and non-sugar crops in St. Lucia. And so a mere seven years after emancipation, which was in 1845, the Special Justice Report stated that many of the former enslaved had established themselves in the vicinity of former plantations, and they had actually started um, utilizing, establishing, sorry, small estates of their own. They grew sugar. They actually created their own small wooden mills or used um, their 
hands and trees and whatnot to actually make their own syrup out of the sugar cane. And so by 1847, nine years after full emancipation, there were 81 sugar estates, 20 coffee estates, and what they call 100 freeholds, which were basically um, smallholders. By then, um, a fifth of sugar cane was produced by the, um, the former enslaved. And by 1880, we had um, the former enslaved developing cocoa into a major export crop. Louise, you have given us yes. such a wealth of wealth. <laughs> yeah. And I hate, I hate to stop you because I, I can listen to you for hours. Okay. <laughs> but I, I want to also transition to Dr. Kenyatta's presentation, yeah. which will tie in this beautiful panel presentation. And I'm sure our listeners too are getting information that they would have never <coughs> heard about before, really yes. enkindling our consciousness. Thank you. Chilno, Atasala. Thank you so much. We're going to yeah. come back to your presentation, also Mr. George's presentation. But at this time, I want to welcome Dr. Joseph to make her presentation. And then we'll follow up with questions at a later juncture. Welcome. So thank you for organizing this panel. Um, the topic is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, I have heard any presentation or any discussion um, in a setting like this, or even I think um, at a conference where the discussion is um, land tenure, land distribution after emancipation. So th this is, um, I'm really happy that this um, topic was chosen. Um, I want to interrogate the topic though. I do think that the, the, the title mm -hmm. by saying dispensation suggests that lands were given. Mm -hmm. And I think from what Louise and what Khalid have already indicated, it was that the newly free people acquired. And I think this is a general um, trope in Caribbean history. Um, I think the initial writers of Caribbean history speaking about Caribbean people and people of African descent mm -hmm. as people who didn't have any agency, so everything was done to them, and so we mm -hmm. refer to them as slaves rather than enslaved, mm -hmm. that this was something imposed upon them. And when it came to um, land in the post-emancipation era, even prior to the um, post-emancipation, it was the newly freed mm -hmm. actually doing many, like jumping through hoops, trying to acquire land. So um, in the same way, when we think about emancipation, we think about them being freed mm -hmm. rather than them taking their freedom. And St. Lucia is such a good example to demonstrate how the um, African enslaved people took their freedom. And in the same way that they will try to get land in spite of all the barriers that come before them. So we know um, there were revolts in St. Lucia um, during the French Revolutionary period, we know that when emancipation was declared in 1834, the 1st of August, that many of the St. Lucians began purchasing their freedom because they were concerned when in 1834 they heard that they were going to be free, that they had to serve an apprenticeship. And what they heard, and, and that for them was not freedom. Mm -hmm. And we see that a large number of St. Lucians began to manumit, meaning all the savings they had, and it's always a surprise to people that enslaved people had savings. Mm -hmm. And so how did they get those savings? It was by the use of land. So enslaved people before emancipation had access to what was called provision grounds. And because St. Lucia wasn't um, extensively cultivated, as um, Calix would have mentioned, um, enslaved people had access to a lot of land. And planters allowed them to use the land to grow their food, because the planters believed that it would be cheaper to have them work and plant food rather than they, them import food from the US and wherever else they were getting food. And so the newly, sorry, the enslaved people were growing um, provisions to, you know, um, apart from ground provisions, they were rearing chicken, um, pigs, goats, mm -hmm. um, fishing, but the, using that provision ground that was given to them and for subsistence, but also they would have some surplus which they would sell at the um, Sunday markets. Mm -hmm. And with those monies, that's what they used to wear, buy the Madras cloth to um, create all their fantastic um, dresses and 
I'm aware um, that is the money they also use to save to purchase their own freedom. So they're already using the land to free themselves. And so even in the um, use of that provision ground, that land began to be used as a communal ground. So that when, if I owned a piece, if I had access to this piece of provision ground, my children would have it. And so truly the newly freed people when emancipation came felt that they had a right to that land because not only were they cultivating it for their subsistence, but they had been able to use the fruits of that land and the profits from it. And so de facto, they actually owned that land. So then when emancipation came, the expectation was that this land was going to be theirs. And that is where the idea of the right to the soil came up during um, the, what they call it now, the riots, the 1847, 48 riot. That's where that came up, that they truly believed that. And I will probably speak about it later, but that is where also the idea of the family land came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I think I want to um, mention is that why, well, I've already identified why land was so central mm -hmm. to the idea of emancipation. Um, we also have to think about what did emancipation mean. So for many people, they think about emancipation only maybe the year 1838. But I think many of us researchers, historians, we think of that in the present period mm -hmm. that we are in, we are still in the post-emancipation period. Mm -hmm. And part of the reasons for having that kind of idea is that many of the structures that existed in the immediate post-emancipation period are still with us. So in terms of land usage and land ownership, it has remained basically the same. So you'll see that there are a large proportion of land is owned by the state, crown land. And then in terms of private land, most of it is owned by a few people, some of them, many of them not resident in St. Lucia. And then you have the general wider population owning some land, but most of them just having access. And by that, I mean leasing, renting lands. So the newly freed did extremely well by being able to get um, lands. In fact, I was reading this morning where this writer who is from the US was comparing what the newly freed in the Caribbean had done in comparison with the US. Say, excuse me, and, and the rest of um, the Americas say that it was remarkable that newly freed people in the Caribbean had been able to access and own so much land. In fact, they were the largest landowners in comparison to other freed people in other parts of the Americas. That's wonderful information. Can you put the boot? I try my I pause. You're listening to our discussion on emancipation in St. Lucia and the dispensation of land. We'll be right back. And kindling our consciousness, Emancipation 2022 presents the Lawaz Festival Guafet. A burst of color, culture, food and entertainment at the Constitution Park on William Peter Boulevard, Castries. Tuesday, August 30th at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Come be part of a cultural sensory experience. For more information, go to CDF Facebook page. Participating partners, Government of St. Lucia, CDF, NRC, Umbutu, ICA, NYC, FRC, Denry North and South Constituency, Sufre Council, Sufre Foundation, Archaeological and Historical Society, SLHTA, and Events St. Lucia. Bienvenue encore. Welcome back to what has been so far a very riveting discussion on emancipation and land based on our discussion on the division and dispensation of land after emancipation. Manier, Lucifer, by te après emancipation. Before we went to break, we had wonderful presentations by Mr. Calix George Jr., Mrs. Louise Marpreseri, and Dr. Terence Kenyatta Joseph. At this juncture, I want to engage our panelists on some of the very critical points that they would have mentioned during their presentations. And one particular point I want to raise 
is based on these historical practices and experiences of our people in terms of access to land, what, what seems like very classist and racist policies too. How do you think this currently impacts our people's relationship with land and issues of empowerment? Who wants to go first to on this one? Um, Based on the, I can, re I can repeat, based on these historical practices in terms of who had access to land, who could purchase land, the costs, the tariffs, the taxes, how do you think that has impacted the current relationship that St. Lucians have with land, especially from a perspective of empowerment, mm -hmm. people's ability to, to develop, to provide a meaningful life for their families? Well, one thing is for certain, um, I think St. Lucians have seen it as a means of, of capital accumulation and wealth, mm -hmm. and they don't like letting go of their property. Uh, and I think they see that because of that very um, reason that it is that form of empowerment. It is um, something that um, they believe, especially that their families may have worked for, uh, their ancestors worked for, and so they really want to hold on to it. And um, in a way, and I mean, and perhaps that comes into the whole issue of family land under our system, because we had uh, this modified um, French system um, uh, in, in our civil code, uh, the, the way that a, a land was inherited, of course, was very different from the other British colonies in that um, it was a very fair system in the sense that everybody got a share, provided that um, a person died intestate without a will. It meant that the wife got a share, the children got their share. Um, and that's not the same, of course, as in a number of other countries where you actually just, it just goes to the first son um, or what have you. So it, it really meant that um, the, the family had uh, something that they had to hold in common uh, and then they had to pull together to, to make it happen and to work um, towards it. So you, you, the, the family land concept, um, in fact, in some respects, um, preserves the land um, from potential sale and exploitation because you've got to have everybody coming together to agree um, as to how it should be um, actually um, dispensed with. And, and so within that context, I think there is certainly, up to this day, a very healthy um, desire and, and, and desire to protect land as, as a symbol of themselves, as identity, um, and, and who they are, really. Yeah. Thank you for that point. Ladies, do you want to jump in? What are your thoughts? Well, my first thought was that um, we do have that tendency to as opposed to if, um, well, we do have the family land um, based on the, the law that the, the descendants of, um, or the, the heirs all receive the, the land as opposed to an individual heir. Mm -hmm. And we tend to, as opposed to the heirs receiving that land and then liquidating it and dividing it, we tend to keep it and pass it down for generations. So I do see that sort of maintenance of that valued um, piece of, asset that remains within families um, and it's I could see the link in terms of how we did in order to survive we needed it was nest it was crucial for us to actually cooperate and come together to purchase land and also then work together to invest in that land because there was there was really no other way to do it the former enslaved persons did not have the capital and the monies to hire labor and so I could see that link between how we did things and how we feel about land and how we retain land now. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, um, like the persons who would have been freed in 1838, I think almost every solution still understands the power of land and owning land. And I think sometimes I feel saddened too that in, in, in so many ways that we still have so few people who actually own land. And some of that has come out from the pricing of land, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about in the early um, post-emancipation era, where so many strategies were placed to prevent people from purchasing land. And some of those strategies still exist now, if, and, and, and we don't understand that they are still there. So that frustrates me because we understand 
what owning a piece of land means for an individual and the family, the ability to um, send a child to school, the ability to um, put up a house, a roof over your head, and not think about the bank um, being at your doorstep or your, um, your, your, your landlord, landlady. And so we still have this very, you know, deep desire to own land. And, and that, of course, and this is throughout the Caribbean where we see so many disputes. In fact, when I was visiting the um, archives, when I was a regular visitor at the archive, the number one thing I saw people come into the archives for was to be able to trace their heritage, not in terms of, oh, these are my family members and I want to create my family tree, but how can I demonstrate that I am um, a, I'm a benefactor mm -hmm. of this piece of land? And, and they pay to come to do that. They, they do that at the archives. I, I don't see people doing anything in terms of paying um, to use the archives other than that. And so that demonstrates how much we see um, our ability to be um, economically independent to have a say in our society is related to the land. And we can talk about, you know, our navel string is born there. That is how tied we are to the land. A lot of questions of the money are so relation on the agriculture, epipepno. In the presentations brought forward, it was quite clear that our ancestors were industrious persons who did not have an aversion to agricultural development and utilizing the land for forward movement. Very often in discourses, we hear persons say, well, St. Lucians are lazy, they don't want to go into agriculture. Based on the information that you would have done in your respective research and even in your presentation, where do you think these attitudes and misconceptions come from relating to our relationship between the land? and especially in agricultural production and our people not wanting to engage in it or being lazy, among other stereotypes? I guess I could start. Um, my first thought is that um, I thought about this arrangement that I read about whereby um, some of the landowners who have land in the town, say town of Viewfort, they would have their homes in Viewfort, but they would also maintain a space. Um, close to a plantation outside of that district. And what they, they would do that merely because they did not want their children. So they would invest that amount of money to ensure that they have a house in the town so that their children do not live on that um, plantation, near the plantation with them. And so they would work, farm for their subsistence and to earn their living and also work on the plantation and visit their families on the weekend. So that was something that was done because they perceived that situation where they labored on the plantation as um, sort of something that remember, had them remember in the conditions of enslavement in the mm -hmm. years prior. Mm -hmm. And they felt that distance in their, their children. And edu through education, they, will, they would encourage them perhaps to find another means. But this was one group. There was also the group, of course, of persons who owned large um, areas of land and involved their children as part of the whole system of family labor. But your point may be linked to these sort of arrangements where persons felt that education and distance from that is the way forward. Well, it was actually connected to a point you raised in your presentation when you spoke about them being industrious, going into lime production and other things like that. Yes. So it, it showed that they had their own entrepreneurial mind and spread as to how land should be used on their terms rather than being connected to what the planter wanted. Very much so. And that is one of the things I liked about the, what, when I understood the peasantry, I saw we are not trying to own land to be like you, like planters. Even the way they utilize the land, the way they use land rotation, you would read about the um, observers saying, it's very you know, peculiar how they use the land. They leave that area unused for a certain amount of time, or they interplant um, certain crops, or they put their coal pits in the middle. So there was a lot of sustainable sort of use of the land. That now we see that sustainable. But at the time, it was the, the best approach was seen as you plant everything with with cane or 
But, but also, right, so we have to be real and say that um, agriculture in St. is very difficult. It's backbreaking. It's difficult topography that you're dealing with. Um, a lot of it requires uh, a ridiculous amount of effort. Mm -hmm. And it's also very difficult to mechanize. Mm -hmm. So whereas we talk about agriculture in a lot of other countries, they're talking about uh, you know, being on a tractor. You know, there's a lot of systems in place to, to support that kind of, of, um, of agricultural activity. And so I don't think it's that we um, have a problem with, with agriculture in and of itself, but the reality is that the, the amount of output that you can get out of it, is, there, there is in fact a, a bit of a ceiling in that regard. I mean, and this was the, the reason why you saw individuals like William Arthur Lewis in the 1930s looking at the issues already of um, agriculture across the British West Indies and realizing that, look, we have to industrialize. We have to go to that next step in our economic journey. Mm -hmm. So I think the type of agriculture has to change in, in that regard. And um, the other reality is we've been facing a lot of um, pressure to, to get away from the estate, so to speak, because people wanted better wages, better opportunities. And that has been uh, uh, something that has been going on continuously. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the number of St. Lucians who, and people from the West Indies who went to the Guianas, um, who went to Panama for the canal. And interestingly enough, they repatriated a lot of those funds to buy land, mm -hmm. right? So they were, they were still interested in getting the land. That there's no getting away from that when they came back. Um, that's what they wanted. When they went out to war and came back after the Great War, they, they were very much interested in getting land. But the reality is that the land that we have um, is somewhat limited in its capabilities, mm -hmm. right? So there is so much that we can effectively do. And so I think the conversation about agriculture needs to change um, in terms of how we modernize the agriculture system. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the reality is that when you look at any economy around the world that has developed in the United States, which has a huge agricultural output, um, it's only representing, what, less than 2% of their GDP. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we have to be um, pragmatic about um, a love affair of it. Right? We, we definitely do want to see um, food security, but it has to be within the context that um, there was a shift of going on, uh, even in St. Lucia. I mean, castries, for instance, by the 1880s was booming as a result of shipping and coaling, and there were a lot of people who went to the, who left these rural areas already and were heading to the, um, to the town because they figured that they were able to make a, a better living there. So that process of urbanization, I think, has also changed the whole focus of, of where we have land. And in fact, Mr. Seri pointed that out too, the idea of having more than one piece. You want to have, yes, you want to have your estate, but you also want to be able to have um, some presence in the, the urban center as well, which was a very um, prominent um, um, practice mm -hmm. of these agricultural owners during that period of time. Fascinating. I want to jump into the point about the peasantry, because I think we do not talk enough about the legacy with Tesla, that the peasants actually left for St. Lucian people to actually acquire the level of development that we currently have. And some of it was touched on, but I want us to go back to the legacy of the peasantry, how they utilize cooperation and kudme to really establish themselves and their communities. Any one of our panelists are free to jump in. Okay, so let me just say something. Um, when we talk about peasants in the Caribbean, I think Louise already gave us um, a definition. We are talking about small landholders or persons who just have access to land, whether they lease it or rent it. Mm -hmm. And um, in St. Lucia, when, when lands were actually made more available by the state, by the crown, it was only when the British government stated, well, we need more agricultural products from the Caribbean. So they, were go they began importing a lot of citrus, a lot of um, bananas, and so on. It was only then that the crown in St. Lucia, um, sorry, the government in St. Lucia decided that it would make lands available for um, the small peasants to um, cultivate. So the initiative came from the British government, not from the um, local government. And so they now began to free up some of the crown lands. And 
during that period, we see, as Louise would have mentioned, so many um, smaller crops. And when I say smaller crop, in terms of the amount of um, income it brought in, mm -hmm. um, began to be cultivated. But I wanted to bring in the Indians in that, because when we talk about emancipation, we always speaking about the Africans, but we have to understand that the Indians came as a response to um, emancipation. And I'm going to link that to the peasantry. Um, so when they were introduced, their contracts indicated that they were to get, well, some of the contracts, either a piece of land or 10 pounds or free return passage to India. In the initial period, no crown lands were made available to any solutions, really. And so we see that Indians would have, um, with the 10 pounds that they got, some of it they would have used to buy private land. So it wasn't until the 1870s when um, the government was making an effort to sell crown lands that we see Indians beginning to purchase land. And that is um, crown lands. And that is how Indians began to be part of the local peasantry. And um, I just wanted to um, give some um, figures in terms of what was happening with Indians. So for instance, um, in the monies that they got from the government, mm -hmm. well, not from the government, as part of their contract for working, in all between 1888 and 1898, so a 10-year period, mm -hmm. they would have received 7,615 British pounds. In today's money, that is about $840,000. And from that money, they purchased land. And I remember um, maybe about 10 years ago, um, a researcher who was doing work in Mabuya Valley um, contacted me because she was puzzled why it was that the Indian community in the Mabuya area had such large um, tracts of land in comparison with people of African descent. And I had to explain to her because that money, and there was a point where they could take the cash or the, or land. the land, and nobody took the land because the land the government was given obviously wouldn't have been the best land, not near to a road, not near to water, not good arable land. Mm -hmm. And so they preferred to purchase the land themselves. And if sometimes if they purchased private land, they might have been able to get it cheaper because land was fixed at one pound per acre. And this is something that also exists um, now in terms of many people want to, would, it's cheaper to buy five acres than to buy 10 square feet. However, you do not have that money to buy the five acres. And this was something that they experienced. And so that was one, actually one of the strategies that the planters had, the planter mm -hmm. class, to prevent both Africans and Indians from purchasing land by making sure that they, and they could only buy it in three hectares. Sorry, I'm um, carry, I'm saying hectares. <laughs> um, three carry of land. So these were some of the challenges, but this um, was how Indians now became part of the local peasantry and became part of that same group Louise was mentioning, who began, and they didn't just stay, they didn't necessarily do lime, and so they were doing a lot of um, farming in terms of rice. Mm -hmm. They were doing a lot of animal husbandry. So the licenses for butchers, when you look at it, you see so many Indian names became butchers. Even though you know they were Muslims and they were Hindus, and therefore had an aversion to uh, meat, um, <laughs> pork, and oh, cows. cows. But they used their knowledge, I guess, and, and saw an opening where maybe too many people were not engaged. And so they, that was also the way they were part of the peasantry, which I think many people don't know that story. Oh. I think that is, that is enlightening information. So I, I know, Mr. George, quickly to give us a point on what was shared. Well, I was just going to raise that um, in as much as it's the good idea is, yes, we want people to have land, mm -hmm. it did have some very negative effects. Eh? Mm -hmm. And um, I think somebody mentioned it, but I think it was you, Mrs. Seri, the issue of the amount of crown lands that you had before versus what you have now, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of those lands that were being um, given as crown grants were way in the interior. The British government was very much interested in opening up these in lands in the in interior. Mm 
And so you had um, the Bad Lil, for instance, the, the Goldsbury Road was opened up during that time. There was a plan to um, have a road from Sufre across to Miku, the Murray Road, it was going to be called. And uh, really looking to develop these places, which were not very suited for the kind of agriculture um, that was there. And we saw the results of that, eh? so, in so like 1938, where you saw the Ravin Poisson disaster. That was last um, And then, of course, we've seen the history. Um, it was a really important point that Kenyatta was making that the, the colonial um, well, agenda was really setting the pace of some of the, the land um, agendas. And so we saw that with bananas very much so. After World War II, the British wanted to have their own banana producing islands and countries, and then they pushed towards um, having persons get into banana production into the heights of Miku and areas that were not really cultivated that were under forest. And we've now seen the implications oh, um, on our environment. But on I'm that point, of, okay. I, I, we'll just hold that point. Okay. We'll come back to the emancipation agenda in just a moment. We're due for a break. Welcome back. We have in here call. You just listened to the song by Marcy and Tumpak Te. And this was deliberate. Family land constitutes an area of great contention and is very critical to the discussion of emancipation and land. At this point, I'm going to share with our panelists some historical excerpts on family land, particularly in St. Lucia, and to inquire from them their points of view. Multiple or communal land tenure is a phenomenon widespread among Afro-Caribbean peasantry and is commonly known as family land, with Kaidia Koyol Tefomi. It's a system of unrestricted cognitic descent whereby undivided holdings of land are bilaterally inherited by all descendants of the original property owner occupier. In other words, inheritance is transmitted through both mother and father. The land is not partitioned after the death of the parents and the heirs do not acquire tenure to a specific portion. Policymakers and many researchers have condemned the system of family land in the Caribbean as anachronistic, wasteful, and a barrier to agricultural modernization. It is generally agreed that St. Lucia has the highest incidence of family land and while the system they also constitute an integral part of peasant culture of resistance. There are unique features. And this excerpt was taken from a piece written by Christine Barrow in 1992, Family Land and Development in St. Lucia. What are your views? Well, I remember looking at, a, I think it was a 2004 um, report that was done, I think it was by USAID, I think it was on looking at the labor markets and what have you, and land markets, sorry. And I think one survey they did put um, private ownership, like individual ownership at about 37%, and family common um, properties, parcels, by I think are somewhere around a third of, of all land um, in St. Lucia is, is family held. Uh, I don't know if that figure has changed. Um, and I did speak highly of it earlier on as something that in a way kind of protects um, the land from being sold out. Um, which is a very real pressure that we have in terms of land speculation and mm -hmm. um, outward f outer forces um, coming in to try to purchase them. But it can be uh, difficult in because if you've got 30, 100 
in, um, persons owning a, one property, mm -hmm. one acre, um, you know, the mutations become impossible. Mm -hmm. and, and so in some respects, there is a need to um, look at it and to ensure that there's some, um, you know, maybe massaging of the legislation um, in this regard. I know there have been studies done by the OAS making recommendations to that effect, and some of them are very old. Uh, there was a Land Reform Commission, which was done as well back in 1979-80. Um, so there have been a lot of efforts um, to look at it and a lot of very good suggestions mm -hmm. um, as to how it can be um, dealt with. But we really have to gain, I suppose, the political will and to realize that it is an issue mm -hmm. that is causing a lot of, of um, concern. I, and as much as we have people going to the archives, as Kenyatta mentioned, to look at, at um, you know, tracing their land, um, when you look at some of the, the criminal activities too, the, the conflicts that you have right now, a lot of it is about land. Yes. And, and so we do have to deal with, with that as a society to see how we can better manage land tenure. Thank you, Carlos. Go ahead. I think that my first thought is um, in today's society, the financial systems, they do not provide a lot of opportunities for persons with family land. So that in itself is an issue because if I own as an individual an area of land, it can be utilized um, with a financial institution in terms of it is recognized as my asset. But I cannot go and say that I'm one of the owners of this 100 acres, so mm -hmm. I have this asset. How could you um, utilize it in terms of um, using it as a surety or, you know, to, to provide me for a loan or for any sort of financial advancement? So that part of it, it sort of hinders the progress of those who have inherited that land. Um, however, as Kalik said, there is that challenge. How do you then um, apportion land well, when quite often families do not want to subdivide or get rid of that land? Mm -hmm. So when I look at um, family land, so I can see the benefits and the disadvantages, and I, but I, I always bring it back to why, how did it come about? And it wasn't only in St. Lucia, there was family land laws legislated. It was throughout the Caribbean because, but I guess St. Lucia would have been a little different, but all of them would have some variation. But in the immediate post-emancipation period, it's when the family land laws were instituted. And one of the reasons for this was an attempt to prevent the newly freed from acquiring land also. So one of the strategies was to only give one deed for the land. So if you mm -hmm. bought a piece of land, you could only get one deed for it. So it made it difficult mm -hmm. for um, family members, if they were allocated a piece, then to, um, you couldn't go to the registry, land registry and get a deed. And so if we think about it in terms of its genesis, although there were a lot of benefits because this is what the newly freed had already been used mm -hmm. to, communal lands from the use of the provision grounds. So it was something familiar, but um, to think about it in terms of how, why it was instituted from um, the legislators was really in a way to disadvantage. And so we see that that legacy now in our present era has really created many disadvantages for persons who would like to, um, you know, advance, um, cause so many disputes. It may, um, I don't think I've heard any cases in St. Michel lately, but Every time you hear a brother and a sister not speaking with each other, <laughs> you can almost certainly say there might be something behind it doing with, um, which is related to mm -hmm. land. And so, as Calix was saying, um, maybe we need to go to those many people who are involved in disputes with family land, and those Good who luck. aren't. And find out how would they like it resolved, you know, like a mediation. <laughs> And maybe then we can get some ideas, mm -hmm. because they do have ideas, mm -hmm. how these kinds of things might be resolved. I think what's interesting when we talk about family land, and even the quotes mentioning that it was anachronistic, is the fact that mm -hmm. it really represents the fact that we have a kind of dual society. You have the colonial mm -hmm. legislatures with how land can be accessed that is disadvantageous to the peasantry, and you have their own indigenous forms and systems that they have adopted to help make their own lives better. So how now do we reconcile this in a post-emancipation, in an independence era where 
persons can live in a way that does not create conflict for them, but empowers them to live freely. Um, I wanted to say something about um, what Louise was speaking, and not necessarily in terms of what you were saying, but just to add to what Louise was saying in terms of how persons have utilized family land and the different um, ways they have taken care of the land. A lot of that actually came um, from the indigenous population also. Um, so the, the Africans would have observed some of the things they had used and used it um, in terms of cultivating lands here. And um, mm. Yes, yeah, interesting. I, I, yes. I always wondered whether it was something that was handed down for so many generations from the persons after they came in from Africa, yes. or if it was some of, some of it. So, 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 yeah. some of, so they would have come in with some, but yes. sometimes we forget that there were people they were actually interacting with who were there when they arrived. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, these um, indigenous people would have been planting in the mountains especially when they were trying to avoid European colonizers. So I just wanted to add that. I know it's not responding directly <laughs> to what you mm -hmm. had asked. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yes. And, and I think also, in terms of the solutions to it, um, some of them have to be legal solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you create um, shareholder companies, maybe, as a means of, of doing it? Because when you look at a, a parcel of land, especially in St. Lucia, it's not all equal. You may have 100 acres of land, but then there's some parts that are almost you know, undevelopable, the, the, the four, you and know, the, the gorge, the, right, <laughs> exactly, the areas that you want to keep as, as conserved. So you really have to, um, in some, in many instances, try to, in fact, not have more mutation of the property, um, which sounds a little bit bad because, you, you, yes, you want to have people to mm -hmm. um, gain more um, property, but then I think it's how it's done. And I think that's where um, state policy has to come in to look at, um, you know, availability of housing, because that's, I think, is one of the principal reasons why people do want to, to have property at this point. And uh, invariably, they may have land in the countryside, in the rural areas, but not really where they necessarily want to be. Or um, So we have to look at that, I think, a little bit more to um, balance off and take away that pressure um, from some of these lands. That's a, a very critical point. And as you were speaking, Mr. George, I was reflecting on one of the programs that government would have brought in at a particular tenure, which is the PROUD program to regularize persons mm -hmm. owning land, persons who are, would have lived on land, but would have never had any deed to say, I am the owner of this land. And through that, persons could then send their children to school, to mortgage, to have financial empowerment and mobility, which is what we really want to have when we think about land and emancipation, particularly for persons at a point in time that they were classed as land, as property, mm -hmm. now coming to live on land as freed people. Yeah. At this point, we're going to go to a break. And when we return, we will delve into greater questions that our audience may have for our panels. Stay tuned. Enkindling our consciousness, Emancipation 2022 presents the Lawaz Festival Guafet. A burst of color, culture, food and entertainment at the Constitution Park on William Peter Boulevard, Castries. Tuesday, August 30th at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Come be part of a cultural sensory experience. For more information, go to CDF Facebook page. Participating partners, Government of St. Lucia, CDF, NRC, Umbutu, ICA, NYC, FRC, Denry North and South Constituency, Sufre Council, Sufre Foundation, Archaeological and Historical Society, SLHTA, and Events St. Lucia. Thank you. Welcome back to our program on the division and dispensation of land after emancipation. Before we went to break, we had a riveting discussions on land family land, development, empowerment, and emancipation. At this juncture, we transition into our question and answer segment where our audience will pose questions to our panelists today. And we have a first question by Mr. Calix George Sr. Good, thank you very much. But um, I'm not going to ask any questions. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is to uh, amplify and comment on some of the things that um, the panelists have said. Uh, first of all, the question of 
of land in St. Lucia is very, very complicated, complex, and has a very, very long history. Uh, the question of the difference between what happened by the British government itself and the planters who controlled most of the land in St. Lucia is very relevant. Mm -hmm. And it is only in 1897 yeah. that the British had a commission called the Royal Commission that came down to see about the conditions in the territories. And the whole question of land came into the, into the picture. The Crown eventually started to give the land, I think somebody said it was, it is in fact one pound an acre. Yeah. And I have papers to show that because my grandfather I bought certain lands uh, at a pound an acre. And so you had an influx, a, a rush, so to speak, of local people buying the land. There was, of course, various mechanisms that they have for what I call capital accumulation by the peasants, by the, by the, by the ex-slaves, if you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And that was, some of you all have mentioned it, the question of um, uh, a kind of a sharecropping thing, the metayers thing. And also, in the case of the metayer, dealt with mainly sharecropping, a kind of a sharecropping arrangement. So the, so the, so the peasants were able to accumulate um, land um, cash so that they could purchase the land. Then you had, there's another one which, uh, Dave Bullet will correct me on it, I think. The one dealing with animals was called Dumwate, where you had a kind of a Imagine. arrangement where you had animals, where somebody would care the animals, and, get, uh, and get perhaps at Christmas or, or so you would. Yeah sell or get, you get the milk in the first instance and then afterwards you sell things. So there were, there's both the metaille in the crop side and, and the dumoite. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Dumoite in the, in, the in the animal side. So you had those kinds of, of mechanisms. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was the, the question, and somebody mentioned a bit about differences in having a piece of land here, in view for they talk about it, that was very common. And I'll give you a very good illustrator of that. Some people from the North, for example, in, in, the, in, in, in my family, for example, my grandfather had spots of land at castries. And most of the people from the North in Babono area mm -hmm had the townhouses in Mondino. Wow. All right? One of the famous guys who had a, a, a spot in Mondino area was Wilton. And that's how you have Wilton's yard. Oh. He was actually a farmer from Babano area, but had a house spot in town. In the, Babylon in the area there. You also mentioned about the, the illustration that you mentioned about the Indians now. We're talking about most of them are butchers. Mm -hmm. Well, you had both the Muslims and the Hindus. Mm -hmm. The Muslims were the butchers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the butchers right now in St. Lucia are Indians. Mm -hmm. And where do they come from? They come from Mark, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. around Crown Lands, mm -hmm. because that was the settlement when they, were, when they were brought in. That's one of the areas where they settled. So anytime you want your, your beef now, mm -hmm. you have to go down to Mark right, because of the more or less the Indian connection. Mm -hmm. Now I want to come down to the question of the um, uh, family lands. Now, in the case of the family lands, they're good and bad. 
In the case of St. Lucians, they have a desire to own their own piece of land that is ingrained in the St. Lucian psyche. When you tell me. And that is derived from the fact that we had both English and French, but the French, when, when we acceded, they acceded to, the, to, to, to the British, the French insisted that the laws, their laws, had to be adhered to. So we have what is known as the Napoleonic Code, mm -hmm. which describes how land is to be distributed by the family. So that in the English system, you have what is called a primogenitor, where the first you know, inherits and so on. But in the Napoleonic system, everybody has a title. So when the old man dies, Half the share goes to his wife, and the other half goes to his ch ten children. <laughs> now I have a give you one set of children. My my great grandfather had ten children, right? And let us he had a piece of land up at Babono side, ten acres. How can you divide that? Because he had ten children and so on. And we have the problems right now of these things, and I'll give you an illustration. You see, in the modern times, you now have to show your paper. Number one, you have to have two IDs, which is ridiculous, of course. And for you to be getting a connection to Lucilec, you have to have the title to your, to your property. OK? And what has happened in the 10 acres some of them going to build their house, and then you'll go in the yard and you'll see about three different generations in that thing. So it's totally chaotic. So how do you have one guy who coming on to want to build his house right now on the family land? And Lucy Leck these days says you must have your thing. So what I do is that I have to write a note to say that this is property land and so on, and that I am in charge, and that I give permission for so and so and so to erect a house. So it has implications for the current generations, and how that is going to be solved in the future, I do not know. Of course, there are ways in which you can do it, and I want to, to tell you that in 1980, I was a member of a commission, a land reform commission, and a lot of the things that you're asking to help solve, some of them I, gave, I made recommendations. And I would uh, uh, employ you all to read the chapter that I wrote on land reform in St. Lucia, starting off with the issue of land use, a land use plan. And you have implications, for example, right now with the case in Anse-Livroin, okay, where you, because you do not have land a, a, a land use plan that where the government says you can do this or you cannot do that, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and until such time that we do that, we will still be in a lot of trouble. So I'd advise the nation to go to chapter five, I think it is, in my old land reform commission, okay. and some of the, so, the, the solutions are there. For example, I have given a, a recommendation for what is called a land development authority. And in that land development authority, you would have what I call a land bank. And they would take control of the thing for two things. One, where you, very, you have very large estates and some of it is not utilized, you can take it and divide it, all right, into various holdings and so on. And in the other case, and I described the areas, for example, around Derry, so and so on, the areas in St. Lucia, where the family land is severe, 
And so you need not division, but consolidation of the small holdings. And there, there are ways in things. First thing that they did, actually, as a result of my recommendations was the land titling. And that is why now in St. Lucia, you have the land titling thing, which where you actually have to get a note of your, part, your parcel, your lot, and so on. It was as a result of that commission mm -hmm. that that came into being. So, Alex, you know you are a wealth of information, and I feel like you need your own show where we can sit and discuss and ventilate the issues of land. Okay, sorry for taking... No, no, no. No, 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 I have to say thank you. It is, not, it is not an admonition that the information that you are sharing should be stopped. But it is a wealth of information that you are presenting to us. Well, that's why when my son told me about it, I said that I must come. <laughs> I must come at least to, 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 to sort of educate mm -hmm. the, yeah. the nation about it. Because we have, we have if you read my, 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 my chapter, you have a lot of the solutions. I hope you will. I hope you will make a copy available for the Folk Research Center's library. Well, as you well. have to. You have to get my son to do that. <laughs> but he doesn't. He doesn't obey me, right? <laughs> Raiza, I have got your your thesis. Yes. And I asked him because I can't read the thing. You know, with, you know, the electronic thing. And he hasn't done it for me yet. So if you pressurize him, then. maybe he's and going also to I want, for me. I, I also want because I'm very, I was very interested about the other lady. Okay. Um, in terms of the the uh, the, pe the rise of the peasantry and so on, because I I follow it up, and I, well, of course, I've done a lot of reading on it as well, and it's in, of course the two of you there are in the same mold more or less and of course between you is another historian who has done some work on that Wood, Woodville Marshall so yes. thank you yes. thank, thank you so much I think I think you deserve a round of applause yeah. for that wealth of information that you have presented to us oh, yeah. I'm not sure if any other member of our audience at this time wishes to make a comment or to ask a question feel free to go to our mic and I can see Mr. Mark Hennicat making his way there and I want to thank Sir Calix once again for ventilating these issues. While this is a panel discussion on emancipation and land, it is by no means exhaustive of the issues that are currently at play. And we invite members of our public, the private public sector and government to continue these discussions because they are quite relevant for our present day. Mr. Enicat, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, panelists. Um, a pleasure to be here and get this type of education, you know, in a, in a certain almost personalized um, I just wanted to know, any, any, I'll throw out a few questions. How, how did natural disaster impact um, land use at the time, and even titling? Um, also, how, how did some of the vernacular churches come by all the land that they have now? Mm -hmm. And it's not like people were just giving it to them. People had families, you know? So how, how did that come about? Um, and uh, there, there, there was, not as much um, rec recording as we see today. There was a lot of oral tradition that we had to depend on. Um, how did that impact, you know, even functional literacy? To, to what extent were people um, disadvantaged with the absence of records? Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm, this is rhetorical, eh? but it's just to, <laughs> to generate the sort of discussion that I think. And then um, I, I I asked the general question, following from Mr. Mr. George's um, comment. Did, did the LRTP project do good for the majority of people, or has it yes. subjected some people to? No, it's done excellent, but it's not complete. Because there's a discussion that speaks to persons who are not present on island to have identified land and they may have lost it. How much of that has been recorded? No, there's a thing which they introduced what we the to the okay, yeah. where, where the group will come together, and you could sell the property and leave your money in the bank. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, and, and the last observation I, I want to make. When we speak of Queen's Chain, the land was not at the time um, developed with roads and, and highways as we have. Some plots were landlocked and persons had had to access from sea. What, what 
transpired as far as an extension of the Queen's chain into inland, for example, through rivers? Did they observe the sort of um, free, free access into the interior? Um, and was, the, was a river treated as part of the Queen's chain? And if so, when a river traversed properties owned by two different persons, what transpired? Who owns or accessed that river? Who? Yeah. Mr. Anikat, so. I think you've given us the sequel to the panel discussion. <laughs> oh, yes. in a, in a, uh, Some very interesting, very questions. pointed questions Things for the benefit of our panelists. Yeah, you've right. touched on the impact of natural disasters, the church and the acquisition of substantive land in Saint Lucia, the impact of literacy in terms of being able to access land and title, as well as Queen Street. Our panelists feel free to touch on any issue you feel comfortable with at this moment. Let me just, um, I can say something on, very, very brief on the natural disasters. Um, so I, I did read where, for instance, um, some of the newly freed people and even later on, um, when they were cultivating estates on the Metea system and so on. And if there was a hurricane and so on, and all the crops were lost, whether through landslides and so on. So there were a lot of disputes over that, like, should they get um, proceeds from that plot? And those they were leasing and renting and owned, now that there was a landslide and they, the land no longer existed, well, no, nothing could be done about that. So that was something I um, saw um, in terms of natural disasters. But um, in terms of, you see, what, what happens is that by the 1860s, 1870s, a lot of the reports that are coming, that have been created by the government are, very, are not very um, narrative. So if we look at the period before, there's so much richness in the type of information given. Talking about, we spoke to this individual and that's what they said and so on. But by the time you get to the 1870s, a lot of statistics. So those kinds of stories, we are not seeing them in the documents. So I, I think maybe that's why uh, maybe the 1898 hurricane, we, I'm sure that a lot of those issues came up, but you don't see any of that, what happened to the common people being um, stated. Yeah, I think it's only until the, um, the early 20th century you begin seeing some legislation regarding um, soil conservation, mm -hmm. um, the creation of forest reserve. Right. Um, I mean, there was a significant problem with, um, you know, planting on, on land that certainly was not suitable. And, and that, that was, um, because, because the reality is that the early colonizers had really no respect the, these um, royal surveyors, they just used to come, <laughs> they used to cut up, draw lines across mountains and valleys and gorges. And I remember there was a, um, even in the case of Dominica, which is even more mountainous than that, a lot of the lands that persons were given title to, they couldn't even get to their lands. Uh, it, it was just not um, accessible. And so um, it was a, a significant challenge. And I think the environmental aspects and appreciation of that only came up a little later on. Um, in the, the 1900s. Um, and so we've, we certainly did lose a lot of our biodiversity um, as a result of that. And it only got worse as a result of um, monocultures like bananas, which um, came into full force by the 1950s uh, and onwards. So it, it is something that I think um, we clearly have seen the um, impact of. Like I, mean, I, I mentioned earlier on the Ravin Poisson um, example of that. And I'm certain that there were others. But in terms of the responsibility, the colonial government invariably took no responsibility for um, telling people to go and develop these lands in certain areas. Um, but later on, there was a lot more research done and understanding of soil science. And eventually, there was a, a better appreciation of land capability and, and planning. Um, um, so that, that came on later on. Church lands, um, a lot of it was actually donated. Um, persons died. and. Um, as good Christian soldiers, they donated to the church um, their, their earnings. And so you see the church actually gaining a lot um, in that way. But even earlier on, like um, in Groselay, for instance, all the land around Groselay town was, was, was church property. Uh, and um, then there is a similar situation. So the church did acquire properties of their own. 
um, because I remember that for a while, um, priests who were on the, the establishment, the civil list, they actually got paid eh? <laughs> by the state for the function that they, they, they played. So they were able to acquire um, a lot of land in that regard. Uh, I just want to touch on a little bit about the Queen's Chain issue because I think we, we didn't really talk about it, but it's really important even in terms of um, those early um, individuals. They went to the Queen's Chain and they saw it as an opportunity to survive. And there's a really interesting um, story um, in, by George William DeVoe, who was Governor General, uh, Governor, uh, Governor of St. Lucia in the 1870s, and, and to whom we also got that whole um, Quebec code being brought into St. Lucia at the time. But he actually was able to protect the interests of some individuals, landless people, in canneries where the planter was trying to throw them off the Queen's chain. And um, he actually was able to say, look, this is crown property, and their interest was going to be protected in that regard. So the people of canneries were actually, the, the village of canneries exists as a result of, of that. So the Queen's chain is a really important aspect of our, our defense, of our ownership, and I think it's something that we need to respect and ensure that it remains within um, the, the state ownership and, and something not to be given up. Um, and just to come back a little bit about the environmental issue and the, the impacts that we're seeing up to today, the Pitos is a good example. Mm -hmm. A lot of the Pitos are actually privately owned because the estates went up along the, 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 the slopes of the Pitos and there was planting going on there. So some of the issues that we have now in terms of conservation exist because of the fact that the system of, of land tenure didn't really make a very great respect to um, environment and, and capability of land. Thank you. I think that that last point was critical because it reminds us that the past is present. Mm -hmm. Very often when we have discussions about emancipation, people say, well, that's things that happened in the past and they have no relation to what is currently happening. But what has happened in the past impacts everything in the present and we are creating the present past for someone else. As we wrap up our discourse, I want to just invite our panelists at this time to just share closing thoughts in about 30 seconds or less. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to encourage um, all St. Lucians to become familiar with our history. Um, I do teach a course on St. Lucian history and I always encourage the students to buy the book, The History of St. Lucia by Hampson et al. And they often don't buy the book. So I'm imploring parents, if your, your children are going to do that course, buy the book, because it is a book that everyone in the family can um, read. I have a friend who I gave it to, uh, a copy, and she reads it with her daughter on evenings. You know, and her daughter is 11 years old. You know, so encourage St. Lucians to become familiar with your history and, and purchase that text. I would like to just point out that we need to remember the peasantry when we think of our history. Maybe we might have to consider in the future changing the term we used to refer to them. Mm -hmm. yes. Because um, Safa Lewis said that the point at which a peasant that is no longer a peasant is something that is up for debate, but it's not something he had engaged with at the time. Because we had persons who owned hundreds of acres of land still being called the peasantry by virtue of their origins. And so when we think of the contribution of the peasantry, and what I, when I say on the shoulder of the peasantry, it's beyond the fact that they contributed to export markets and they fed the nation. They actually caused a shift in policy because of the contributions that they made by the time the 1897 commission arrived they recognized diversification, small landholders as person, as the way forward in terms of the economic future of St. Lucia. And with that came the $1 a pound acres being sold. So the reason many of us are actually daughters or granddaughters of landowners is because of that initial sacrifice of that group of landowners we call the peasantry. So like Dr. Joseph said, we need to learn our history because you get a new sense of pride when you learn about these stories. Well, I mean, our motto is what the land, the people, the light. And I think the <laughs> land is really, really important. We all need to appreciate it. And um, the whole idea of private ownership of land is something that I think needs to be balanced. 
it's definitely a, a, a Western concept that uh, did not exist prior in these parts prior to 1492. And I think we also need to appreciate the common ownership of land as being very important as well. Um, there are certain things that we all have to share um, together. I think Mark was kind of pointing it to, 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 towards that. The rivers, for instance. It, they, they, there are some gray areas, the, the forests that we have to maintain, the, our really special and beautiful places, our beaches. They all have to be as much as possible shared by everybody. And so we also need to have that conversation about entering as much as we want to own our own, we also want to own it in, in, in common. And I, and I hope that is something that we can also aspire to um, in this post-emancipation era. After such substantive, insightful, reflective points brought forth by our panelists, all I have to say is thank you. Merci à pile pour toute information. Jordia. Thank you too to our audience in studio and watching virtually. Emancipation is for life. And I want to, at this point in time, thank all of you who reflected with us on emancipation and the topic of land. And as our panelists fittingly stated, no one gave our ancestors land. They worked, they toiled, and they saved for it. And we too have a continued battle to fight in terms of how we create a relationship where land, people, and our nation have a relationship of empowerment and development. Thank you for watching our program. Why land in the sun? What's going on? I don't understand. Babu, no mashton, and all around. Seems to me like we're losing ground. DJ Panaras in the house.